There are many interesting and inspiring people around us. In this episode, I will be directly connecting with one of them, Mr. Cormac Smith, and I shall be asking him several questions about his professional experience. But before I will do so, let me first give you a short introduction of his professional career. Cormac is an Irishman who spent more than 30 years in London and more than 18 years working for British government departments in various senior communication roles. His main professional focus over the years has been change management, helping both organizations and individuals to improve how they communicate. He has also done a lot of work in the areas of media and presentation skills training, staff engagement and crisis communications. Between 2016 and 2018, he worked on behalf of British government for the Ukrainian government as strategic communication advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Pavlo Klimkin. Before we go to our discussion, Cormac is sending a message of appreciation and respect for his remarkable time when working for the Ukrainian government. When I think about my achievements in Ukraine, I always say that I was incredibly fortunate with the people that I fell among. And there really is, you know, far too many to name from um, government ministers to senior officials to um, diplomats, um, you know, across um, many government departments, but in particular the MFA. But, you know, there's two people that I really must mention. And first was the foreign minister who I worked for, Pavlo Klimkin, who was one of the most exceptional men I've ever had the privilege to work with, but also um, the woman who was my manager and my boss on a day-to-day basis, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Kiev, Judith Goff. Um, and, you know, without people like Pavlo and Judith, and as I say, many, many others, too numerous to mention, um, it wasn't about what I did in Ukraine, it was about the work that we managed to do together. It's been a great pleasure, Cormac, to welcome you here and also thank you very much for joining this discussion. And thank you, Andre, for the invite. Um, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. So let me begin with my first question. You have worked throughout your career for the British governmental authorities in various communication roles. Could you briefly guide me through this experience? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, not for my whole career, but from about the year 2000. I've worked um, for a um, a, a variety of local government and central government departments. Uh, Before that, in the 90s, I spent most of my time working in pharmaceutical PR. And before that, which we won't go into, um, I used to work in the fitness business um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. But yes, I've worked for government broadly since about 2000 um, and um, held senior positions in a number of UK local authorities. Indeed, you and I first met when we were working together for the London Borough of Richmond upon Thames, as you remember. Um, in 2016, um, I was asked to um, go on secondment to the Cabinet Office um, to carry out a number of specific tasks. And the secondment was initially going to be for three months. So. After the three months, um, my boss, who's senior civil servant, asked me if I. Um, fancy the idea of doing some foreign work, to which I initially said no, because I love my life in London and my home and my partner. But thinking about it, um, I came back and I said, look, if I can go to Eastern Europe, um, I would really like to consider this. Reason Eastern Europe, I've spent, since about 2014, I've been, I've been, I've been getting invited to various former Soviet and former Eastern Bloc countries to um, speak on government communication. Mm-hmm. And through that time, I've developed one, a great love for that part of the world, because quite frankly, the welcome that I was given no matter where I went, and I've been like, to 11 different Eastern European countries over the last six years, was fantastic. But more importantly, I developed a real fascination with the journey that people in Eastern Europe are on as they work hard to transition from their communist past Yes. to a more open, democratic future. And I just developed a real um, a real interest in that. So when I was asked to do work for the British government abroad, I said, yes, but I really want to work in Eastern Europe. 
and indeed there was a job um, uh, um, um, in Ukraine. They were looking for somebody, um, a senior civil servant who would, um, who would work for Pavlo Klimkin, the foreign minister at the time, as his senior communications advisor. So I applied for that job, several interviews with both senior British officials and Ukrainian officials, and happy to say I was uh, chosen for the job. So I went off to Ukraine in October, the beginning of October 2016. Between 2016 and 2018, you have worked on behalf of British government for the Ukrainian government, mainly to change the way they communicate. What were the challenges, changes, and what was your strategy in changing these communication styles? Oh, that's a big question. You know, um, I think the th I, I think there were I think there were three challenges. The first challenge and the most important thing to get right in any communications um, scenario is leadership. And in Ukraine, what I found was a government which was still very much tied to the past and the old Soviet style of leadership, which means that people at the top of the organization weren't used to letting go and to um, delegating responsibility and really trusting other people mm -hmm. to get on with it. And, you know, in any part of business, this is vital, but in communications in particular, it's not just what the minister says, you've got to have your whole team singing from the same sheet and telling the same story. So the first challenge I think that we came across was to was to work together yes. on how we could help, how I could help the Ukrainians um, on their journey to change their leadership style. The second challenge I think was around planning. And what I found very, very quickly was, um, and my Ukrainian friends won't mind me saying this, I used to tell them, <laughs> um, my good friend, you're planophobic. Um, this was a joke, but I found that there was they were very good at firefighting. Look at how they fought off the Russians in 2014 with volunteer battalion. They're a tough, smart, sophisticated people. But I didn't think they planned very well. And the more I spoke to colleagues who were working with the police and who were working with other government departments and who were working with the Ukrainian armed forces, people were telling me the same thing. And one day, a colleague said to me, a very senior colleague in the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said, Cormac, look, you keep telling us we're planophobic. It's because of what a plan represented in Soviet time and how horrible those plans, those centrally created plans were, and everybody didn't like it. So now, you know, yes. we are averse to planning. So the challenge was to the challenge was to work with the Ukrainians to develop a, a better type of planning because, you know, when you have limited resources, you can't make the most of your limited resources without having a good plan. And my God, the Ukrainians have very limited resources. And the third challenge was around the story. There was when I went, the first thing I noticed was all I heard in the news was negative things about Ukraine. In my first two weeks in the country, I started learning about so many positive stories about Ukraine. The wonderful role played by civic society, civil society, um, help which had come out of the Maidan Revolution of Dignity. Um, some of the fantastic progress they had made in the previous two years to um, really tackle corruption and to, and to transform and, and their country. There was so much that was positive. And so much in Ukraine, in their culture and in their cities and in the place and the people, there was such a positive story to tell. And I didn't really think that that was being told to the world. So we worked, the third thing was to, was to work with colleagues in the Ukrainian government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in particular, to get more message discipline and to work on a, on a clear narrative that we could, and indeed we did, we came up with a, we came up within my first month there. Um, we came up with the idea, you know, Ukraine has actually made more progress in the two and a half years since the Maidan Revolution than in all the years back to independence in 1991. And within a year, the foreign minister used this, the prime minister used this, the president used this, the World Bank used this, the, uh, the foreign minister of the United yes. Kingdom used this. People were using this around the world and it was giving us a focus to tell a more positive story about Ukraine. 
And in terms of so telling this, perfect. In terms of telling these positive stories, is it mainly through social media, television, or newspaper, or what kind of uh, media uh, that was a focus? Do you know what, Andre? Everything you mentioned is just channels. The most important thing about communication is the leadership. It's the people that tell the story. So yes, you have to. It's you know, to first base to get off first base, you have to understand social media. You have to understand how to deal with the with the uh, traditional media. You've got to understand radio broadcast. You've got to understand stakeholder communications, internal communications, staff engagement. You've got to be able to do all these things. But these are only tools and channels. What you've got to do is you've got to get the leadership united behind the story and, and inspiring and leading others to tell the story. So one of the first big, big jobs I did when I went to Ukraine was to get, um, I think it was 14 of the most senior ambassadors across Europe with, um, with um, um, recalls to Kiev. So I could work with them for an intensive week to decide with the minister and with the ambassadors and the other senior officials what are the most important stories you guys and girls have got to be telling Europe about Ukraine. And in that week, we worked on we worked on what the most important messages were, and those messages were around what was going on in Crimea. They were around they were around getting people to really understand understand the the the, 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 the negative role that Russia and the Kremlin was playing in interfering in Ukrainian affairs and trying to hold Ukraine back. And it was about also telling the world the real true story about Ukraine um, and reforms. And while yes, there was still, and to this day, Ukraine still struggles with corruption, but the story was actually we've achieved an awful lot that you're not talking about. Yes, we have a lot yet to do, but it was about turning that around to make it to get on the front foot to tell people that you know that that that, that 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 there was a positive story. So I think that was it. It was getting initially the senior leaders, the minister, the minister's top team, the directors of the ten different directorates that made up the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kiev, but also the key ambassadors who I some I became very good friends with and still keep in touch with. So the work that the work that we did together with the European ambassadors in my first few months in Kiev was hugely important because these were these were the people that were telling Ukraine's story in London, in Rome, in Paris, in um, um, in Finland, in, in you know in in, um, in various European countries. And what was important and what was missing was that we were telling the same story and the same the same priorities. So I think you know that was a that was something that was important and but also for me I met some very senior, some very influential people early on. So it really helped in terms of me building relationships and trust, which of course is the only way you're gonna get anything achieved in a big complex organization and indeed a country like Ukraine. You have worked in Ukraine as strategic communication advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pavlo Klimkin. How your role can be understood in this assignment? Oh my God, how can my role be understood? Um, uh, where do I start? Well, look, um, I worked directly with Pavlo um, and his senior team. Um, I also, as I've explained, I did a lot of work with the ambassadors. But also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there were 10 directorates. Mm -hmm. So day to day, I reported to the political director, who was also one of the um, most trusted advisors of the foreign minister. Yes. Um, so we would work together. We did a lot of a lot of training, a lot of workshops. So we would get people from the senior teams from the different directorates in a room together for half a day. Mm -hmm. And we would actually discuss what was meant by strategic communications. Not what I necessarily thought was strategic communications or what we thought strategic communications was in London, but what strategic communications meant for them, what they wanted to get out of it, and 
how we could work together to make strategic communications work better. So it was always very much of a collaboration and working with people. I was very clear from the start. I'd never been a diplomat in my life, mm-hmm. and but I had listened to a lot of other diplomats, some good, some not so good. And the ones that were good told me that I had to build trust and I had to understand the culture and I had to be modest. The ones that were not so good say, oh, we're brilliant in London, in Washington, in Paris. We tell these Ukrainians what to do and they'll do it better. That's not the way to do things. Not when you're dealing with um, I mean, the Ukrainians that I met, you know, were very well educated, very smart. Excuse me, I speak one language well. Most of my colleagues in Ukraine spoke four, five or six languages well. So I was the one that was feeling inadequate. So, um, yes, it was about very much about very much about building, building that trust and working across the directors. I've mentioned already the importance of developing relationships and working with the ambassador so we could um, get that message out across the different important countries we were working with. Yes. Something else I always like to do was to work with um, was to work with young diplomats because I was very, very clear. There were some very smart young people working in the ministry, but I was very, very clear that they were the future of Ukraine and it was important. It was important to get the message at every level, not just to the minister who I was very fortunate to see on a one to one basis, probably on average once a week. Right? And we would sit down late in the evening, maybe eight o'clock, half past eight in his office for maybe an hour and a half, and we would discuss various issues. It might have been a op ed for the New York Times that we had done together, or it might be our plans for leadership training and for for, for introducing a different type of leadership and how we were going to do that together. Um, and of course as time went on I began to meet people in other ministries and in all I think I worked with five other ministries as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Also did some work with NATO, with the NATO mission in Kiev and also worked with the um, with the, um, a, a, and the Security and Defence Council of Ukraine and indeed lectured at the Kiev My Whole Business School on a number of courses for senior civil servants and business leaders and politicians. Um, I use the word lecture. I shouldn't. I don't like the word lecture. It was they were workshops where we worked together with large groups to um, really to you know the, the same thing to to tease out to see where we could introduce new ways of working.